Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm Tim Becker. You don't have to call me Mr. You can just call me Tim. Um, I'm going to assume everybody knows what EMB is. EMB, it's about the uh, smart card on, on, on credit cards. Um, I work with these quite a lot. I've, I've developed where I was involved in the development of several uh, operating systems that, that, run on the, uh, that run on the chip. Um, and I do other consulting in that field. Uh, I also build this little uh, microcontroller program that sometimes helps understanding what goes on inside of here or talking to, to this or similar devices. Um, this is sort of a strange talk. It's not really, there's no, I'm not presenting any, uh, any really innovative hacks or anything uh, crazy new. Um, but, but these uh, chip cards are a really, really nice uh, toy to, to hack around with. On the one hand, you probably have one. Uh, and it's something that you're not really aware of what it actually does. Um, also, from the hacking point of view, this is a really, really old, all these standards are really, really old. And there's a number of issues that are kind of in the specs already that um, make it an interesting target. Um, and uh, I think for, uh, f it's, it, it just has kind of a steep learning curve and, and you just have to get used to the terminology and, and know which standards you need to read. Luckily, a lot of the standards that you'll use are publicly available. Um, yeah, and I just want to sort of give you a small ramp up to, to help you get started with it. And in the course of the, the talk, we'll do a single transaction. I have a reader uh, connected here and we'll, we'll kind of, uh, <laughs> Uh, we'll see what goes on between a terminal and a, and a, and a real card. Um, so the first thing, the first specification that we'd have is PCSC. That was, it was originally the Windows services to, to connect to smart card readers. And basically every sort of smart card reader that you get nowadays is going to support that, which is really nice because almost all operating systems are going to support these PCSC readers. Um, what I used was a, um, this GitHub smart card thing is a, is a, is a Ruby binding to that. Um, these are some pointers. Um, this open SCDP is a, is a Java script based, uh, platform to talk, uh, to talk with, uh, EMV cards, which is not quite as absurd as it sounds because there's in the factory where these are personalized, the, the programs that are written to generate the data to put onto the card are actually, uh, are one of the standards for that is, is, a, is JavaScript, which is kind of weird because everything is byte oriented and JavaScript has some difficulties with bytes. Uh, and this open, S open smart card development platform um, has that same API um, that's, that's used. Uh, and finally, I wanted to uh, point to something which is really strange but very, very nice. MasterCard has, has published this terminal simulator thing um, and they're usually really, really restrictive about this technology and, and won't really let you know anything, but they basically have these programs that behave just like a, uh, just like a credit card terminal. Um, and if you want to get, in, uh, if you want to get started, these are really nice because you just sort of plug in a normal, um, card reader, hold the card to it. If it's a contactless card, stick the card in and you can see how a proper terminal is supposed to behave. So you don't just have to read specs, you can see it live and in action. Uh, it's a Windows program though. So basically to get started, you just need any run of the mill uh, smart card reader. Um, so this is what I have, this is what I kept doing at the beginning, hoping that nothing crashes and to make sure that a smart card reader is there. Um, and then I can just say, show card and I get some information about the card that we're going to go through in a little bit. There's two dif different types of protocols that, that, contactless card, uh, that, that contact cards can speak, which are T0 and T1. So this card is a T0 card. And the ATR is the answer to reset, which are a bunch of bytes. OK, so uh, yeah, that, that's going to come up. Um, the main specification for, for communication, communicating with smart cards of any sort is, is our ISO specification 7816. The stuff that you would want to look at are three and four. Everything, all the other standards there are completely irrelevant. Um, and these two specifications uh, describe 
the basics on an on a application level of how to communicate with the card. So how commands are structured, uh, how, how things are encoded. Everything below that is really just on an electro, electrical level. Everything above that is ISO stuff. They just defined lots and lots of things that nobody uses. So this answer to reset that we received, uh, it describes physical card characteristics, like how, how quickly uh, the baud rate of the card, but it also has these historical bytes which uh, identify the, the producer of the card. A lot of the time you can just turn it over and you can, up here you can see this is an Obator card. There's really not many companies making, uh, making uh, EMD cards. So that provides you some information, but unless you're, you really want to talk to the card on an electrical level and you have to figure out the baud rate and the communication settings for the card, you don't want to worry about that. So ISO also has these weird, this is one of those file system things, and the EMB people decided to just do something completely different. Um, so they don't use this file system. So these 7816 uh, protocols are, uh, uh, specifications are very confusing to read because you just don't know what parts of the specs apply to you or not. So the important thing in the central communication unit between a smart card um, and your program is an APDU, an Application Protocol Data Unit. And the important thing to realize, when we're looking at all these slides, it's really just a small amount of bytes that are stuck behind each other. So basically, if... Let me demo select. What did I want to demo? Um, so the, the first thing you have to do, there's a number of applications or files, it's sort of a fine line between that and smart cards. The first thing that you have to do is select the application that you want to use. Uh, and the APDUs are always structured in the same way. The first byte, the zero, is the class of, um, of command that you're sending. The second is the instruction byte, which is the actual command that you're sending. Um, the, you can send two parameter bytes. Um, then you send the length of the data that you're going to send, and in the case of select, you're sending the file name. So this is this A0003101010 is the standard file name for Visa for the Visa application that's on cards. Um, the T0 versus T1 is fairly irrelevant. Uh, the main difference that you would have, and sometimes you have to program it and sometimes you don't, is that, um, so you have this LC byte and you have an LE byte. If you expect data back from the card, uh, you would add this LE byte. But in T0, you can't both send data to the card and tell it to send you data back. Um, so you have to leave out the LE byte and then the card will say, oh, I have data to send you back and then you have to send a second command to get the data back. But those are... Uh, details, which are important once you get started, um, but that's the only difference that you really have to deal with T1 and uh, T0. The first time I did this talk, I said nobody uses T1 for at least for EMB cards. Mm, turns out it's used a little bit, and there's some subtle bugs that go along with this T0 and T1 thing, but we can talk about that uh, later. So to do a select, um, I'm going to select a PSE file. PSE is payment service environment, and the payment service environment is basically a, um, a table of contents of what applications are on the card. So you can see that, is this large enough or should I make it bigger? Okay. Um, this 00A4 that we had, the first parameter 04 says I want to select using a file name. There's other mechanisms to, uh, to select. Um, and the file name is this long, and this is one dot PS uh, payment. Yeah, it's right here. That's the file name, and I send that. Um, I don't send the length that I expect to get back because this is a T0 card. Uh, and the card says answers with 6126. What you're actually always looking for is 900. That's okay. That's HTTP 200. Uh, in this case, the 61 says, I still have bytes to send back to you, so please issue a get response um, APDU. And the, APDU, uh, the, the get response APDU looks like this. I tell it I want 26 bytes back. I'm not sending it any bytes, so, um, so it can do that. And then it sends me the 
basically the file entry for for this PSE, which is not all that interesting. It just tells me the file name uh, and and some some little stuff. But then I uh, read record. Okay, I will just skip that part. <laughs> um, so basically, it's just uh, 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 files going back and forth. Um, the next set of specifications that so this is uh, these are still the standard commands that are in the seven eight one six standards. Um, those, of course, you have to buy from ISO for a lot of money. Um, EMVCO publishes all the standards for um, for the EMV protocol that's talked to, that's spoken to the cards. Um, and there's just a huge number um, of books that they have. Four books for the central thing. There's the CPS, which is how the cards are personalized in the factory. And the four books are basically kind of like. Uh, you can kind of imagine it like the specification for XML. It shows you how to set up a protocol that talks to cards, but it doesn't really um, it doesn't really define a specific protocol. And EMB also publishes CPA, Common Payment Application, which is a really really long specification which defines one specific card protocol that you could put on cards, but nobody uses it. Mastercard and Visa have their own protocols that are set up on EMB. So. Um, book one is basically what you need in, if you don't want to buy 7816. It really talks about the electrical characteristics, how to talk with smart cards, how APDUs are set up, and things like that. Um, book two is all the crypto and keys and key derivation um, uh, things. and um, Kind of interesting, not what we're going to go into. Um, there's a lot lower hanging fruits than, than actually dealing with the crypto. And book three is the ap actual application. It, it shows, it, it describes the commands that are sent to the card and received from the card. Um, and if, if you want to deal with this, because all of the data that you get from the card are in, in TLV structures, so if you have something identifying a piece of data, you just have hmm, a 5A stuck in front of it, and you have to know what that means. And at the end of book three, this is really the most important thing. There's a data dictionary, um, a big data dictionary table that maps all the tag names to, uh, or all the tags to tag names. So, and the TLV encoding is defined somewhere. And finally, there's a book four, which uh, does cardholder attendant. And so that describes what uh, the requirements for a, for a card terminal. Uh, I've I've never really used that. Um, it might be interesting if you want to build a fake terminal to you know read. It's very clearly defined how a terminal is supposed to react, what sort of messages it's supposed to display. So it might be interesting for that, but uh, not really just to play with the card. So CPS and CPA I've talked about. Uh, you, they might be interesting to read into, but you don't really need them to get started. So the, the, speci the actual specifications for the protocols that MasterCard and Visa uses are proprietary. Visa is really nice about it that they actually give you a list of the specifications. MasterCard, you don't even know what specifications exist. Um, and you kind of have to dig fairly deep to, to they're not publicly available. Um, so we're gonna go and, 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 and do the transaction now. And basically, I kind of this is I kind of describe it. You shake hands, you introduce yourself. What we already did, you ask, okay, what what um, what uh, what applications are available on the card? You get that from the PSC, or you just try a number of well-known application names, and then the worst date ever. You don't just talk about yourself and ask some questions. You say, hi, you know, this is me. I'm in terminal. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself, and then ask me some questions for you me to ask you about yourself, um, which are basically, you know, tell me, give me these records, give me this record, give me that record, and once you have all of those records assembled, you have enough data to actually do the transaction in the terminal. You need to confirm the data. There's a small certificate confirming that the data that you get from the card is actually the data that the bank intended you to see. Um, 
Finally, you do cardholder confirmation, which couldn't be anything for a, my favorite cardholder confirmation method is nothing. Um, but it could be a pin, it could be a pin that's checked by the card, or um, they're, they're, they're more involved cryptographic. Um, it could just be a signature as well. And then finally, you get the card to generate a cryptogram for you. It could be done with that, depending on the, on, on the, on the fraud um, settings of the terminal. Or you need to send that cryptogram to the bank, get the bank to confirm the cryptogram, get it sent back, send the, uh, send the card, the response from the bank, and then the card will finally give you a certificate saying this transaction has been successfully completed. So, uh, if I had been able to remember the correct parameters for that, I would have read that there is a VSDC um, application on here, excellent. And this is the same thing again. I just did a, um, I basically would have found out this uh, application name from, uh, from, the, from the PSE directory file. Uh, I select that, the card tells me I have 2C bytes to tell you about this file that you just selected. Uh, and these are the bytes that it, uh, that it sends back. And so we need to decode the, decode the, TLV, and so let me get that further. This is a file control information template. Uh, it has this name, so tag84 is the tag for dedicated file name. Um, it contains some proprietary file control information data, which in this case is the application label. That's what the terminal will display to you when you put your card in and it says Visa Master or, or whatever uh, your card says. Um, and it can contain some information, for example, language priority that a, uh, that a, that a, uh, that a person would have. So um, my, my card has, because I'm from Germany, it has D-E-E-N. Uh, and typically when I'm in Germany, I'll be greeted with German Sometimes when you're in a foreign country, you would also get greeted with German because the terminals actually uh, honor that. Typically, they don't. So the next thing is the, you know, tell me what I should ask you about myself. And that is a, a command that's called get, uh, get processing options. Um, which is not really that, in, the response is not really that interesting to decode because it's just a big, it's a response message template format and there's 14 bytes in it. But um, this is really where the card describes itself and tells you where to get further, what else to ask the card, what, what other information to ask about it. Um, so you send it PDAL data, processing data, object list. You always have these objects list. In this case, uh, we, we just sent it empty data because the card didn't request any data. And then it sends back an AIP and an AFL. The AIP is, are the first bytes of, of this. So in our case, it was uh, 5C00. Um, and this basically describes the functionality of the card, what the card is able to do. Um, so this card supports SDA, DDA, it can do cardholder verification in some form. Cardholder verification can be do nothing. Um, the terminal does its own, it should, uh, the, the terminal is asked to also do its own risk management, so um, maybe require a signature or something like that. And finally, um, the card doesn't only support offline, you can send things to the bank, get stuff back, and, and, and get a confirmation from the issuer. SDA is, is static data analysis, which would include just uh, you read a bunch of data from the card, and to authorize this data to make sure that it's valid data, uh, you read another piece of data from the card, which is a certificate signing the some data that you read, which is completely, un it doesn't really make sense because cards are trivial to clone that way. Um, so a couple of years later, they started with dynamic data authentication. Um, 
when cryptographic coprocessors got cheap enough that you could put them into cards. So now you can, the card can contain a certificate chain, the card contains its own public key certificate, and instead of just statically signing data that you want to, that you want to validate from the card, um, the terminal can send a random number, and um, the random number and the data from the card are, um, are signed together by the card. Um, so this card doesn't support it. The, these sort of cards that don't support that aren't really in, in use anymore. That's the sort of transaction we're going to do because it's easier and it shows, shows the principles. So the next part is the application file locator. Uh, all the, because um, the amount of data that you can read from the card is, is stuck in one byte, so one, one piece of data that you can get back from the card is always maximum 256 bytes long. Um, so the, the data has to be structured somehow, um, and it's structured into a short file ID and a record number. And th this AFL is basically a list of short file IDs and record numbers that you want to read. Um, they're always four byte long entries, so the AFL that we had, there's three entries. Um, and then it gets kind of weird, and this is the stuff that's confusing to when you start working with it. Um, the first byte identifies the short file ID, but it's shifted to the left by three. So the topmost five bits sh show the short file ID. So in this case, these three, rec uh, these three entries here tell us, okay, we want to read from short file ID one, two, and three. The second byte, so there can be a number of records in these short files, so the, the second byte tells us at which record to start reading. Um, nothing is shifted here, it's just every single one of those says start reading short file ID 1 at record 1, start reading short file ID 2 at record 1, and so forth. The third byte tells you where to stop reading. So from the first one, we just read, from the first short file ID, we only read one record. From the second one, we read three records. And from the third one, we read two records. And the third one, the third byte says, how many of these records that you read from this short file should you use when you're, when you're doing the, um, when you're signing the data with an, either an SDA certificate or a DDA certificate? Um, so which of these data, so not actually all of the data that you get from the card is authenticated by the certificate, but only specific little bits of, of the data. So and in this case, only a single field of the seven, seven records, only one record of the, of the seven records that we're reading is actually getting authenticated. So, I cheated a little bit here, and uh, instead of having to mistype, so this is basically what we decoded earlier. We read short file ID one, record number one, short file, and we only read one record from there. Uh, two was one, and two, and three, and for, from the third one we read two. Um, records. So that was, uh, that worked out correctly. And the one that we're signing is from uh, for the first record of short file ID uh, 3. So, so this is all of the, the stuff that we read from, from the record decoded and we're going to kind of go through that. But let's have a look first at which, uh, what data is this actually? So this is, there's always a wrapper tag 70 around the whole thing and then there's a, a only one record in here, 5A, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there's a 5F34, which is one bit long. So if we look at the, the decoded data, 5A, So only the only the actual the pan the actual card number and the pan sequence number are actually authenticated of all the data that we're getting back from the card. So let's see what the sort of data that we get. One of the first things was service code, and this is just an easy one. It's 201. This is an old thing that that was on the magnetic stripes as well, which is another usage indicator. What are you allowed to use this for? And it's fairly nonsensical data. It says two says this is an integrated circuit card. Um, zero 
says a normal one, and position, and the third one, the one, says no restrictions. So this doesn't really provide any sort of uh, uh, data, and there's a lot of, of these sort of nonsensical data fields around. Um, this is much more interesting, application usage control. So it's FF80. Um, and this is a bitmap that says what sort of, uh, what can I actually use this card for? Um, and this is this table describes the first uh, the first byte. I'm not no um, uh, the first byte, and it's since it's FF, all of the ones are set. So this card is valid for domestic cash transaction, international cash transactions, uh, and it has the same. So it, they differentiate between cash, goods, services, which is kind of a strange differentiation because it's a very thin line. Uh, what's a restaurant meal? Is that a good or a service? Uh, and finally, you can use it as an ATM, and you can also use it at other terminals other than an ATM, whatever that means. Nobody really is able to explain this to you. And the second byte, the 80, um, this is the only restriction on it. Domestic cashback is allowed. Cashback is basically when you pay at the supermarket and you say, well, okay, the bill was 48 euros, but I want 60 euros, or you know, give me another 20 euros back in cash. Um, which is another higher risk level. They allow that in the country that the, that the card was issued in, but not internationally, because who knows what, what could happen. So the next, I'm, I'm not gonna keep switching back and forth. The values I have on the screen are always the values that we, that we read from the screen. So CVM list, that's the cardholder verification method list. And that describes what I said at the beginning, the, how the, uh, how, how the terminal is supposed to verify that the user is actually uh, in, in possession of the cards. And it starts off with two amounts, which are really never used. So you could have several of these lists, but people don't really do that. And following those two amounts, it says, okay, if you have something between these two amounts, this is the list of um, cardholder verification methods that you should use in certain circumstances. So the first byte, so there's always four, four bytes, and the red and black alternating are, are the entries. The first byte describes which, which verification method to use. And so here, this card supports four verification methods. One, you can send a pin in plain text to the card. Um, the second verification method is you can collect a signature in paper. The card supports that. Uh, the third one is you can send an encrypted pin to the bank, but not, please not to me because I won't be able to decrypt it. And finally, the fourth verification method is the nicest one. You don't really have to do anything. Now, this incidentally is also, I mean, uh, it might not really be clear because there's a lot of wrapper and magic and stuff around the demo, but um, what you saw on the screen basically, these are actually the bytes going back and forth from the card. There's no crypto between the, between the, uh, between the terminal and the card. So this was a really classic um, hack that uh, uh, two or three years ago um, that at ATMs, cards are never supposed to allow the terminal or the ATM to send it a pin in plain text because of skimmers. Um, so cards are configured, if they know they're in an ATM, they send a, a cardholder verification method list that says you can send me an encrypted PIN or you can, you can check the PIN with the bank, but you can't send me a, please don't send me an unencrypted PIN. Um, but because this whole protocol um, isn't cryptographically secure, people figured out, oh, okay, it could be really nice to have a skimmer in between there. And when it sees this command come by, or, or it sees the CBM list coming back from the card, I'll just switch the CBM list around and I'll tell it, no, the only thing I accept is an unencrypted pin. Um, and that way, you have all the information nicely done. You don't even have to decode the Magstripe data. You have everything there, and you've also gotten uh, the stupid ATM to send you the encrypted PIN. So th there's a lot of uh, reuse of, of terminal code out there. So the second, thing, the second byte in the CVM list is under which conditions these should be used. And, and here, and this is also kind of typical, um, all of these conditions of more secure, whatever you want to call it, using, actually using a PIN or something, is optional, you know, if you, if you can 
if you can actually check it, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. And finally, the last one that we had, which was no, don't, you don't need to do anything, that's always valid. You can always use that one. Okay, so um, the bottom, these were the last things that came back. I issuer action codes. Now, this is the card telling the terminal how it should behave. Um, these are long bitmaps. Um, and there are different checks that the terminal can do. For example, collect a signature. Um, and these bits in here describe, uh, while, the, while the terminal is, is, is doing the checks, it sets this bitmap. And if these match, uh, if it matches one of these, for example, in the IEC online, that means if one of these bits is set, you have to go online. You can't do an offline transaction with this card. Um, the default one is you have to go online, but if you can't, then you can still do an offline transaction with the card. Uh, and we can see there's only one, one case that the card defines where the, uh, where the terminal is supposed to deny, uh, uh, is supposed to ask for a denial. Uh, which, ironically, it's the second byte, the first bit in the first nibble of the second byte. So, second byte right here, requested service not allowed for card product. So, you know, the, the card just tells, if you're not allowed to do a transaction with me, you have to decline it, which is kind of uh, obvious. But in, in, in most other cases, uh, it just said, Something failed, I don't have a card number, uh, I, I failed the transaction. And in those cases, you have to talk to the bank, else you can ask the, the card to authorize the transaction offline. Boring. So the next thing is we have, we, we've read all this data, and we have to confirm that it's actually true, because I can build my own card, and I can put another card number in there. Um, so basically, we received this sign static application data. Um, and we can see, uh, what are we gonna do? We might do the demo, it's kind of, uh, it's not that exciting. Um, so the, the ter so it's all, it's all a big PKI scheme. Uh, it's, it's a nice non-standard, there's no X501 or anything. They've, they've had, they have all of their own certificate formats. Um, and the terminal is expected to have a number of um, key, root certificates from, from the card schemes built into the terminal. Obviously, the terminal can't have uh, root certificates for every bank in the world in it. So the bank basically provides its own root certificate within, within the card. So that's this issuer public key certificate right here. Um, when, we when, we, when we decode it, um, this is basically, uh, so this, uh, this issuer public key certificate we decrypt with the public key of MasterCard or Visa. And what we get back is, is this thing which aligns with this table. You, you have to look out for the 6A at the beginning and the BC at the end, then you know you're, you decoded the things correctly. Um, so basically, there's a number of fields. You know, certificate expiration date right here is December 2030. Um, and the interesting part is the issuer public key, of course, in this certificate. Now, because all of these records can only be 256 bytes long, um, the in, uh, an RSA key that you would use nowadays actually wouldn't fit in there, so um, the card also sends back this, the, the exponent, of course, and the issuer public key remainder, which always confused me because of the similarity with modulus, but uh, this is actually this, the data that didn't fit into the certificate. So you have to extract the first half of, uh, of the issuer's public key out of this cryptographically signed certificate, and the rest is just stuck in some, some field. And there's a hash over the whole thing then that's also stored in the certificate, but I'm, I'm not a cryptographer. It just seems not very 
you might as well just have the whole public key um, outside and just save the hash. So now you have the um, the issuer um, the issuer certificate, and with that you can decrypt the SDA, the static data authentication certificate that actually signs the data that's on the card. Uh, once you take that apart, it looks like this. Um, it's more or less the same. Again, you have the header 6A and then the trailer BC. Uh, it has a different format. It consists mainly of padding and then only has the SHA hash of the data that the AFL at the beginning, this record needs to be signed. So that signature is in here. So all of the other data that we read from, from the card, including the issuer certificate, um, is, is unauthenticated. Um, like I said, the static data analysis doesn't, uh, isn't, isn't used anymore, and you're not allowed to use it anymore, but the, the, newer, um, the, the newer systems have a system called DDA, dynamic data analysis, and that basically works the same way. But then there's another certificate in the certificate chain, which contains the private key pair, or, or the, 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 the public key of the card itself. That, that you can use to authorize the card. And it can have a force certificate which, would you, which um, contains the key for uh, encrypted pin communication with the card. Um, these certificates may basically all, uh, all look the same. They have a different uh, signed data format, but apart from that, it's, it's always the same thing. Um, yeah, I already mentioned that. In uh, nowadays, you don't just ask for a, for, a, for a static certificate and trust that the card is in order and use that to, to, to authenticate an online transaction. Now you have the card generate you a dynamic certificate with a piece of data that you provide the card so you can prove that the card is in possession of its own certificate. Um, so now we do, we need to uh, verify the card holder for that. There's a get data command where we can first check um, the value of the pin try counter on the card. So the pin try counter keeps increasing on the card until some limit is reached every time that you try to enter a pin. Um, in this case, uh, the pin try counter is at no, it keeps decreasing, and when it reaches zero, you're not allowed to use it. In this case, the pin try counter is at 14, which I think is kind of strange. Okay, but uh, now we can do a, a verified transaction. That doesn't provide us any data back. It gives us this 9,000. Everything went okay. And the pin is in this really strange padded format. It's padded out with Fs. It starts with a 2. Then the second nibble says how long the pin is. So the pin of this card is 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, the card said that was OK. So we've, we've done the cardholder verification. Um, and finally, we need to uh, verify the deal. We need a cryptogram from the card. And this is a static cryptogram from a triple desk key that's, that's implanted into the card at the factory. Um, one of the data that we read from the card, and in this case that wasn't even authenticated, is the seed all list. And the seed all list, so basically there are two generate uh, cryptogram uh, commands. And there's two seed alls. And basically uh, the seed alls describe what data the card wants from the terminal in order to either verify or deny the transaction. In the first transaction, you can ask for an offline authorization and the card expects this data to be there. So it wants, it wants the amount that it's authorizing. Amount other would be a cashback amount that you provide it. It wants to know where the, uh, where the terminal is, um, the results of the terminal verification. OK, a signature, and you checked it, and that was, that was good. Um, what currency the transaction in, the, the type, the date. Uh, the, the date transaction type is this good services and, and, and several other things. Um, and and it wants a random number because that will go into the cryptogram and, and you can later hopefully prove that the cryptogram and the uh, and what the cards uh, what the terminal sent to it match so 
This, this command is called generate AC, or first generate application cryptogram. Um, and we've assembled all this data, the first six bytes for the amount. So we've done one cent, and then we can kind of go through here. Uh, this will be country. This is a, uh, we're in Great Britain now. Uh, we're paying in pounds, um, and the date, uh, and uh, some transaction type information, and a uh, random number, of course. And um, we know that we're getting back a positive response of some sort. Um, and this is, again, TLV decoding, it really doesn't help us very much. Um, so there's basically three things that you can ask for or get back from the card. Uh, they're called AAC, ARQC, and TC. TC is great. TC is you're done. T transactions approved by the card. Everything is fine. AAC sucks. It means you didn't. You're not done. The card, or, or you're done, and and the card didn't uh, authorize it. And ARQC is basically saying, please do a second generate cryptogram. Se uh, uh, please send my response to the bank, and then with the response from the bank, uh, run a second generate cryptogram um, command. So this is the data we got back to, to our uh, from our from our first uh, generate cryptogram, and it's and it's structured like uh, like this. There's a um, uh, the, the the first byte, the black uh, 80 is cryptogram information data, and that will t um, so in our case it was actually 40, um, so it's kind of non-deterministic. Um, that is information about the cryptogram. What kind of cryptogram is it? Is it a decline? Is it an authorized? Or is it a, um, you know, go to the bank, ask them, and tell me what they told you? Um, the second bytes, and so for my example, it was 03 application transaction counter. That's a central counter in the 16-bit uh, counter in the card, which limits the, life the entire lifetime of this card. Once this counter reaches FFFF, uh, the card will, will, will kill itself. So we can see how many times I have done this. It's at 29 now. So I've done it 26 times since uh, since I made the slides. Uh, the next bytes are the actual. Um, so you can see from this information, you can see how often you've you've, you've used your card ever. Um, the next one is the actual uh, application cryptogram, and this is the stuff that's no longer EMV. This is the, these are the things that. Um, in, in the proprietary specifications of the card organizations, but you don't really care. It's just basically encrypted data um, that you send to it. And finally, issue application data. That, uh, that's the stuff that you're supposed to send to the bank uh, in case the card wants a response from the bank. Oh, well, yeah. So, um, this is, uh, so this is the... The cryptogram information data, the table for the cryptogram information data, and I expected to get back 80, which would have been an ARQC, which says, please talk to the bank about this and then tell me what they said. And these cryptograms are, are, are proof of, um, of proof of the payment taking place and that the card was physically present. Um, for denials, there's there's a little bit of extra information of why it was denied. For example, you, the pin try limit was exceeded or things like that. Um, if the card had asked to um, to go online, um, this card seed all only has one additional field, uh, which is authorization response code. That's what the card what that's what the bank sends back. And usually you might know this. Usually it's zero zero if if the transaction went through. Or if you don't have any more money on your account, you would get 0, 05. Um, so the card just expects that code completely not authenticated in any way back, and it will base its final uh, decision on that. This so we got this uh, response. The card authorized our one cent transaction um, offline. So these are basically the same sort of things again. So this is the, the preliminary uh, conclusion. This is a really, really old protocol. Um, it's very, very widely in use. Um, so it can't really be changed too extremely. Um, and it sort of mitigates the wrong risk. So if you look at this SDA thing, um, it's completely focused on cardholder fraud, in that you wouldn't want to um, 
if somebody makes their own chip card with another card number on it, yeah, you can't do that because you don't have a uh, you don't have a possibility to create an SDA certificate that's in the certificate chain that goes all the way up to the credit card organizations. But the case of the cardholder being defrauded isn't really considered in this approach at all because if I get your card, I can just copy all of that stuff and I can still I can reuse your certificate. Um, and basically have a functional identical uh, card to the one that you had. Um, and it basically keeps going like that. It's usually just the, uh, the, the risk model is, is very much centered on uh, cardholder fraud and not on merchant fraud and not on, on systemic things. Um, and that's the main sort of uh, point there, this reluctance to, to, to part with legacy. I mean, this, this stuff is going to be around for a really, really long time. And the only things that they're changing are basically, uh, occasionally they say the minimal RSA key lengths that you have to do, uh, stuff that is completely crazily insecure, like being able to do an offline transaction without any sort of dynamic authentication um, is being, you're not supposed to do it. Um, and there are plans to maybe someday possibly um, just leave uh, RSA behind and, and, and use ECC because the, the, the key length are getting so, for RSA are getting so long that the cards are getting too expensive. So, but that's not quite true because there was a study recently that they were all crazy about that you're more likely to leave your house without your wallet than you are without your phone. So they thought, well, that can't be. Then if people don't have their wallet, then they can't use credit cards to pay. So they started this contactless stuff more. And contactless is cool anyway. And that's mainly compatible um, with this EMV. The, the flow of transactions is a little bit uh, more different. But it's also compatible. There's two modes. One, you basically do an EMV transaction. And then there's another mode where you basically just do a magnetic stripe transaction. So it really lowers the, the security that you have. So if you basically, you can read out somebody's uh, contactless card fairly easily. And that might say, mm, I really want to do the full EMB transaction, but if you clone it, you have all of the data that you need to do a magnetic stripe transaction. There are a couple of little dynamically generated bits, but because it's, And the other thing, which is really nice, I think, about these attack vectors on, on, uh, on, on, uh, on contactless cards in the future, um, they're really promoting this uh, acceptance of, you know, previously if you, if you came with a plain white card and wanted to pay with that, people would look at you funny. But they really want to accept alternative formats, not just phones, but keychains and, and bracelets and stuff. And so I think it's just kind of a matter of time where you can come with a shoebox and just hold that onto the card reader. Um, and people won't really worry about it. Okay, so basically this is just a short introduction. I'm doing a workshop tomorrow, I think it's over there in 101, uh, around the same time. I hope it's not as hot and I hope it doesn't rain. And basically doing the same sort of thing. If, if you're interested in it, I have a bunch of PCSC readers. We can get stuff set up on, on your computer. <sighs> and that's it. So if you guys have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Questions? Thank you. Um, is with the uh, contactless cards, is there also no encryption between the uh, card and uh, or the phone and the terminal? What, what cards? Uh, with the contactless cards. Uh, and with the, with the if you use your phone, there's also no encryption between the phone and the terminal? Yeah. Wow. Um, that's a lot more challenging to um, to eavesdrop on. I mean, with a with a contact card, you just slide something in between and, and, and uh, get that. I mean, it's 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 easily doable. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of people around here that can do it. But it's 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 a harder level of of, of, of sniffing uh, sniffing wireless and on that close of space. Um, but yeah, it's 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 the same, and it still allows you. You know, and I'm not. 
I'm seriously not promoting like doing credit card fraud, but it's, it's something, I mean, the lack of security makes it really nice to play around with because you can actually see what's going on uh, with your card. And that, still, and that still applies to contactless cards. So if you, have, if you have a reader like this and you have either a contactless card or a, um, or a credit card on your phone, you can do transactions with it and you can you see clear text the entire transaction flow. They didn't change any of that. Any other questions? Hi. When you say uh, contactless, you mean also a PayPass system from MasterCard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what. Um, whoops. Um, Whoops, where do I have the new form factors? Yeah, the f um, and, and PayPass and PayWave for Master and Visa. Um, if they run, I mean, they can run on your, on, your, on your actual plastic card, but they can just have either a sticker or a bracelet or, or um, they're running on the phone, but it would be the exact same protocol going, uh, going through. Okay, so if you would take an NFC uh, uh, this fire chip from my pair, it's more secure than this, or a desk fire chip from my fair. Mm. Well, you can't pay with a desk fire chip, so uh, it's, it's not really a, a comparison. And um, um, I mean, these keys are s the security that the that the that the cards are supposed to provide is keeping these secret keys inside of the card and only giving the world outside of it access to things that were encrypted with the secret keys. Uh, and, and, and they're very secure at that. But all of the protocol around it is so complicated and there's so many little knobs and whistles um, that there's lots of ways to get the card to generate something with its secret keys that it actually shouldn't be generating. Thanks. Any other? One up here. So uh, with the verifying of the PIN, is that a prerequisite before it'll sign anything? Or is that just for the terminal to kind of authenticate that the, the user uh, knows what the um, it's, It wasn't a prerequisite in this case because the CVM list said, I can do that if you would like to do it. Um, the terminal will record a bitmap of all of the checks that it's done. And it will provide that to the card. And the card will... Um, Use that in this, its own risk assessment, whether it um, whether it accepts the transaction, denies it, or asks to be sent to the bank. The bank is also given a copy of the types of uh, checks that the terminal did, and they can use it for their own risk management so as well. So the pin isn't used at all to like unlock the signing mechanism. It's just kind no, of no, a, no. A, okay. Or an extension, I guess it kind of is because. If the card is to configure is configured to not sign an, uh, to not sign a successful transaction, if you didn't enter a correct PIN, then it. But it doesn't physically unlock anything. No. Okay, so thanks a lot.